The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell Obviously, be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process, and hopefully, you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors, or simply download the app. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include super savings and Q super FUM and members at June 2022. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Chris Smith. Chris is a founding partner at Vices Private Wealth where he's been going for a, a bit over two decades, started there in 2001. Uh, Chris has been basically won almost all of the awards. He's been featured in the Barron's Top 100 Advisors list uh, and yeah, other awards including Best Client Service, Top Financial Advisor, IFA Excellence, Investment advisor, SMS advisor. I probably could keep going on, but uh, you know we've only got thirty minutes, so I won't. Chris, thanks for joining us, mate. Great to be here, Ben. Mate, I thought it maybe a good place to start is giving us the uh, the 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 short version of your journey in advice. Yeah, well, tw- twenty one years, so well, twenty three years being an advisor. There, there is a short version, and it's it's probably more interesting than the long version to your listeners. Uh, <laughs> But it, it goes really goes by really quickly. Obviously, um, life's a bit like that. So I started, uh, fortunately, I was offered a job as a trainee advisor in 99, um, fresh out of university as a, of, for, with a sports management degree of all things, <laughs> with uh, grand plans to become a, a CEO of Australian cricket or something similar. Um, <laughs> that transpired to be a short-lived um, dream, given I'd never played cricket for Australia and I that's the only way to get jobs there at the time. Um, so I turned my hand to something else and, and the combination of, of maths um, and people were, was really um, that combination that, that brought me to financial planning. So I took a job as a trainee advisor, which um, I guess amounted to cold calling prospective clients for the management, taught me a hell of a lot about resilience and, and talking to people and, and just being genuine and, um, Turns out I was pretty good at it anyway, but just because I, you know, I loved what I did, I loved sharing financial advice with people. So, two years into that, um, the firm I worked for was sold, uh, and the group that bought us was very much um, from the realm of distribution of products. So they were they were pushing products and quotas down our clients' throats, which you know suited the planning group, not necessarily our clients. So. I, I lasted a week there and we we're actually on the conference in Cairns at the time when the Twin Tower attack happened. Um, that was the great launch of the new company merger. But I got back to Brisbane a couple of days later and spoke to my wife um, who was at Ernst & Young at the time and, and we had sort of a shared dream eventually to, to run our own business. So I know this is the short version, so I'll try and fast forward to the point where we started Vices. We worked from home sitting around the kitchen bench designing, you know, our logo and our ethos and and figuring out what sort of firm we wanted to be. And and honestly, that part came naturally because I already knew looking after clients first, looking after their interests and building long-term relationships was the key. And that's where our interests really aligned, right? Making money for our clients is by, you know, by default going to make us money over the long term. So 
about a year later, ironically, the firm I'd left wasn't doing so well, so I moved back into the space that they occupied in Riverside Centre and took the space off them um, and started the first office of Vices. Two of the partners that are with me now and, and one of the other partners who actually hired me in my first job came back from Sydney and within a short space of time, Vices had formed into a cooperative partnership that we see today um, and has grown to, I guess, 31 or 32 staff including my wife's tax business that um, is part of Vices now, looking after about 500 clients and a, nearly a billion dollars of, of client funds now. Wow, that's, uh, that's impressive growth. And 20 years is a long time. What would you say have been some of the biggest shifts for you guys in, in what you've been doing? Look, the, the biggest challenge was trying to become a businessman. Um, you know, at 25, I was naive enough to think I could do this. Ignorant, ignorant to the challenges that would um, come with running a business and being a practitioner. So I think what we had to change over time was was our capabilities and skills in managing a business to ensure that Vices would be a sustainable practice and be around for the long term. Um, and we had to get very good at running a business so that we could grow and employ staff and keep them motivated and keep them, you know, incentivized to stay for the long term so that we could sort of share Vices with more and more clients and and grow you know to the size we are today and hopefully beyond yeah it's an interesting one i i think i know for me personally like when i started my business it was because i didn't want to have i didn't want to have a boss and there were a few things i wanted to do a little bit differently really love being an advisor love working with clients and started the business uh not dissimilar to you it was just myself at uh at the start then i wrote my wife in after about a year uh, we work together and basically just yeah servicing clients. But a, a couple of years later, made the decision to start growing it more into a business and and growing a team. And it's been you know the the five or so years since has been a a whirlwind because it's a whole different and other set of skills that you need to learn. How do you recruit? How do you manage? How do you onboard? Um, how do you operate? And all of those sorts of things. What have been the hardest parts of that for you guys? Well, I, I told, I'm just reminiscing about everything you just said and, and the, you know, the enjoyment that comes with running a business as well as the enjoyment that comes with providing clients with outcomes and, you know, having them say thanks and hug you and so on. I mean, they're two totally different experiences but equally rewarding. Um, and, and, but the biggest, I guess the biggest thing was making sure that, you know, I could be a good boss and be a mentor as an advisor and, and sort of, if, if you're genuinely a, a focused and motivated on sharing the success that you have with your staff, then it, it becomes very easy. It's not a me versus them. It's it's certainly all about them. And when they're better, when staff get better and, and grow into what you know they can be, then you're going to be rewarded just from the benefits that come with that as well. So you know, I think you know, what we needed to do was trust our staff and, and empower them to make decisions and and set challenges for them to evolve into and and as they achieve those things you know you know so it sounds stupid it's like seeing kids grow up you know it's it's mm -hmm. i'm proud of how good these advisors and and staff that we've had for the long term um, what they've turned out to be what's your what's your biggest hack for getting the most out of people um treat them like adults i think genuinely people want to come to work and do a good job and so the great self-control that I had to apply to stop jumping on little things which were just irking me, you know, you've got to realise which battles are, are the ones worth fighting. So I think that that takes a lot of self-control and, you know, probably the reason I became my own boss is because I didn't have a lot of self-control. <laughs> so that's ironic. So, you know, the, a day in the life of, of having a staff member, you know, made me become a better person anyway. Yeah, it's not easy and particularly like all people are, are different and, you know, how you communicate with them, how you relate to them and that sort of stuff. I know for me, I've found that to be quite challenging because not all people want to be told the same thing in the same way or not all people connect with the same thing being told in the same way as well. So it's probably not too dissimilar to what we do no, with so our right, clients, yeah. but you've got to adapt, adapt what you're doing to the, to the individual and the, the situation as well. Yeah. What, um, what are you guys focused on in the business today, Chris? Uh, well, we're focused on the next level of growth. Um, you know, we're expanding our footprint on the eastern seaboard and, and the silver lining that came with COVID was, you know, your reach these days is um, far greater because people are a lot more accepting of, 
web-based discussions and um, you know you don't have to see everybody in person all the time um, so our big focus on the moment is how do we um, how do we take what we've built which is a very good foundation in running a financial advice business and getting clients great outcomes and figuring out how to scale up even bigger to share that with more and more people and what have you done what's driven your growth to date look you know being great at what you do I mean the the never-ending pursuit of excellence is a is an ethos we have. You know, it's a line we sort of don't just throw around but live by. Is once you once you make a promise and you start to deliver on it, and, and you see how clients respond to that with referring you more people and trusting you to an even greater level, um, then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Is you just keep doing that and you just get better and better. So part of our you know organic growth just came from looking after clients and then those clients trusting us enough to share that. Uh, with their friends and colleagues so you know that's not an easy thing to do is to recommend someone to a financial advisor um, and so we make sure that we're we're very conscious of the levels of service that we deliver to everybody uh, and we don't want to disadvantage existing clients by taking on too many clients and watching that suffer so we're very careful not to let our level of advice and service decay uh, so we're always looking to grow with staff obviously the moment's a bit of a challenge as well uh, with the modern environment. But just generally, I think the other, I guess the other aspect of our growth in the last few years has come with our um, reputation advancement. We've engaged with some very good um, media and public relations firm uh, out of Perth. Those guys, are they just know us so well that they you know guide us along the way. I realised that, you know, you can't be great at everything and that's one thing that I wasn't good at is actually just implementing the media mm. side of things so or marketing side of things. So you know, once we had those guys on board, they put us on a program and similar to the sort of things we espouse to our clients is develop a plan and go and execute it and review it and stick to it and then do more of it. And, um, so that sort of led us down the path of being um, welcoming new clients that sort of we never thought was possible. You always hope for it, but... Um, it's been quite a dramatic shift. We used to probably be 95, 99% referrals maybe four years ago. And now it's probably more of a maybe even 50, 50 for new clients or 60, 40, certainly 60 referrals and 40 new clients from, um, you know, other sources. Yeah, it's amazing. I think these days that people are more open to doing their research online and, you know, looking at things like media or content pieces and those sorts of things before engaging with advisors. I think as people come to realise that finding the right advice firm is partly about making sure that you're connecting with the philosophies of the firm that you're potentially looking at working with, then it's more important to get those philosophies out there so that people can buy into that because there's a lot of different ways to to do advice. So, uh, yeah, I think that's really important. I know for us that we're we're probably two-thirds non-referrals and a third from our client referrals. And, um, you know, they're they're both good. I'd probably prefer if it it was more because I know that people that come from referrals, they're they're already – understand and that's why they've 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 reached out but um yeah, yeah they've already it's, sussed it's, you it's out good too, to see. Right? i think it's good for advice so even if you do get a referral you, you know that person has looked you up and had a look at your material online your website and anything else that's out there but that non-referral source i think is very much uh, the difference for us ben and i'm certain you've probably found similar is the credibility that's established through the awards that have been established over the last few years the ifa magazines the fpa do a great job the barons list you know all of that lends a a certain amount of credibility to distinguish you in that first round of research for people and you know ultimately that helps people make sort of the first filtering decision and then you make it through to the next round and eventually if they make it through to you then you know that's when you've got to stand up and honor everything you've marketed to to say that it's the truth um but you know I, i think that you know, going back to one of the one of the nexus uh, to where we are today was was I'd suggest some of that award winning uh, focus we had on on mm. um, participating in the awards. 
Totally. Uh, the first time I came across your business was in the IFA Awards. Uh, I, I can't recall this, the actual year that it was, but it might have been like 2018 or something like that. And I was like, who the bloody hell is this Chris Smith guy? I'm like, he's <laughs> up there for like every single award. And it, we just started getting involved and was really pumped to be uh, a finalist in a, a couple of the categories there. And yeah, it's a, it's amazing. I think it is. I was just t- chatting to another advisor and those industry awards are a little bit insular with the exception of probably Barron's, which I think that they do a phenomenal job of marketing out to the public. And it's probably partly a reflection of the space that they're in around investment management specifically. They seem to, seem to get a lot more external eyeballs and, and potentially drive a bit more business. But I'd say for the other more industry-based awards that – it is um, a level of sort of validation of of your model and what you're doing. And even though it is a bit insular, when it comes time for clients to look at an advice business, then it, it is it's like the gives lends further credibility to to what you're doing. And it's not just you there with a slick website or a nice marketing message or a good you know conversation that you have with them. It's like you've been put through your paces by people looking at your business and what you're doing and you've got that there. So I think it, it's, it, it is an important and helpful part of, of trust building. Yeah. You know, it was pretty easy to do, Ben, when I look back on it and, and if, you know, over time advisors sort of seek me out and ask me my, you know, my views on the world occasionally. And when we start to talk about those awards and the submissions and the, and the accolades we've had, I always go back to tell them how easy it was to put those submissions in. And, and you know, once upon a time when we first started, it was quite a convoluted report that you had to provide and, and a lot of content. These days it's sort of fill out a box and, you, and you're limited in the word count, which probably helps the judging, but doesn't give you a chance to shine if you, you know, have a lot of content. But we mm. literally just took out our day-to-day activities, you know, where's our strategy map, where's our critical success factors, Where's our pipeline processes? And and by the time you dump that into a best practice submission, uh, it's already been done, documented and used on a daily basis. So not a very big effort to put in a submission. And that was I think that's what we we're most proud of is we've started to get uh, recognition for what we do on a daily basis in, in what we thought was quite a well-judged um, submission process. Yeah, I think it's um, it's great, obviously, where you can leverage that stuff. And the, I think the more media pieces, the more focus you put on your content, your website, your internal and external documentation of your approach to things, then it, it does make that easier because you can just draw those elements in. I also find that for me, it's going through that process for awards is helpful to point your focus at things where there's an area where you're not as strong as you want to be as well. So like we we have just um, done a submission for a the um, best places to work award run through the AFR. And I, I think we're, we're a pretty good place to work, obviously, in my completely biased opinion, but I wouldn't expect that we would win that award, let alone probably make it through to being a finalist. But I look forward to that process because they say, oh, you know, what do you do around these particular areas of your team management? And I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, that's a great idea. We do do these couple of things, but maybe there's some more things that we could be doing here. And what are your benefits around X, Y, Z? And then you go, oh, yeah, actually, we should have that. So it can help you sort of, you know, you can use it as a tool to help you shape what you're doing a little bit more so that then you evolve and grow for the future. And I think that's something that Brad Fox told me way back when, when I've um, got involved in the AFA's Rising Star Award that it's like just submit and expect to not make it through because they're going to ask you questions that's going to force you to think about what you're doing and then you're going to think about it more and you probably level up in a couple of areas and then you can apply again and then you have a better chance because you've you've had that same focus as well. Don't know if you've uh, experienced anything like that in the stuff that you guys have done. Well, yeah, and, and how powerful is it? Because even if you don't sort of end up winning the award, the benefit that you take back to your business on a day to day is is immense, and that's that's where it really counts. So you know it's, it transpires into the the day to day looking after staff. It makes you question a lot of things that will probably blind spots in your business. And as you say mm-hmm. that, I'm starting to think, oh my god, I'm not sure whether we'd even go close to getting a submission together for uh, some <laughs> of those criteria. But uh, 
Well, I think that, that one's still open, so there's still time, Chris. If you want to get involved. Mate, um, I'm interested. You got a team you mentioned 30 odd uh, at the moment, which is which is a big team uh, for a business. For me, I've really uh, one of the things that I've found quite challenging in my business is how to grow the team over time and how to how to structure the growth of an advice business. Obviously, there's some important roles that, and and sort of jobs that need to get done in an advice process, but I found that. There's a lot of different ways that you can grow, you know, between onshore, offshore. We, we're currently working towards, uh, we're working with like advice pods where we've got a senior advisor, an associate advisor, and a power planner sort of working together. We only really moved to that system about well, in the last 12 months. Um, had, what have been the big sort of lessons for you and how have you tackled how, like figuring out how you would grow your team to where it is today? The Million Dollar Advisor book has the, it changed my life. Uh, when you mentioned pods, that that uh, publication, there's Million Dollar Practice, Million Dollar Advisor, and there's another a book that he's released as well. But it talks all about um, pod structures and pod approach to um, looking after clients. So I started out and it, it's evolved pretty much the way I thought it would, but it started out as me and then sort of hire an admin and then we grow a bit and Eventually, I hired a associate financial advisor to be second chair, primarily because I hated writing file notes. And uh, <laughs> what I found is the fortunate byproduct of not having to write file notes anymore is you actually teach somebody because they're sitting next to you when you do all the work. Um, and so we've got a very much a hands-on approach to training and development where, you know, if you went to a business consultant, they'd go, oh, my God, you've got an advisor uh, oh, sorry, a partner and an advisor sitting in the same room for an hour and a half talking to a client, that doesn't seem like a very good use of your time or money. And I go, well, you know, I'm training advisors on how to be next level quality advices. And so if you want that education, you've got to sit there firsthand and see me do it in all manner of circumstances, difficult conversations, great conversations, good markets, bad markets. And so we've we've got a development plan with our associates we, we typically like to hire client service um, staff who have a, uh, an interest in becoming financial planners. So they're either studying their degree or, the, you know, they might have completed it and they're going to move into associate roles. But we, we really collaborate on all of the advice. We do internal workshops. We do X-Tools modelling. We use X-Plan quite a lot. But we, you know, we do modelling presentations. We talk about the technical side of advice. We talk about the sales side of advice. We talk about you know, marketing and getting referrals. And, and then we talk about, you know, what are the sorts of things you need to do and recognise, you know, when relationships are great or good and how do we make make the most of that? And so, you know, I guess we've evolved into today just because I never stopped wanting to be better and, and the growth, I guess, forces you to learn a lot of things like, you know, the next thing might be incentive plans. So we've got to go and read about incentive plans and, and implement them and redraft them when they do work or don't work and, and improve them. So, um, you know, my obligation when to my yeah, staff. There's a, lot, there's a lot to it. So many aspects on the team side. And I was chatting a bit offline that we've just redone our incentive plan. And it's, uh, it is a tricky area where you want to motivate people for the right thing, but it's hard to put a process around everything. And it's like you don't realize until there's a gap and then you're mindful that you don't want to be chopping and changing things around on the team and stuff. So it's, uh, the, there's a lot to it, but for us, we've found that that particularly that pod system, as you mentioned, that it does give you a good, um, opportunity to grow and mold advisors into the advisors that you want. And yeah, I've been, we've employed two senior advisors over the last six months and, that was a very, very long process to find someone that was the right fit for the team culture, clients, business, growth plans, all of those sorts of things that I'm really heartened now that having three quality associates in the business means that when it comes time to find the next advisor, that they're going to be ready to come out of the blocks firing. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think it seems to work well, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to be right with that one, I would say. Yeah, I think the exception is more than the rule, isn't it? With um, with team structures and and trying to seek perfection, there's uh, you just need a different personality for the whole rule book to be thrown out and uh, have to change a few things. So it's uh, it keeps you on your toes for sure. It does. 
Chris, what would you say, like, from from an advice perspective, what's the skill that you found hardest to master to be the advisor that you are today? Uh, geez. Um, probably interpreting what people say and what they really mean was was mm-hmm. quite the learning experience. So, you know, particularly new clients and perhaps clients that might have been with you for a while and, and maybe feel like it's maybe it's all too easy, not as interesting now as it was in the first few years, like that honeymoon period's over and the seven-year stretch starts. You, the, you know, the textbooks have got it all. But generally, you know, the art of listening and, and making sure that I was really listening for what clients really meant when they said things. And then, so therefore the questioning, um, you know, being, a better, uh, being able to ask better questions to get the real truth and, and let people trust you enough to share their innermost fears and worries and discomfort with you. And that just comes from being genuine and honest. So, you know, if people aren't scared to tell you what they think about you or what they feel about their situation at the time, um, you know, you've got to be better at that. So, what you know, that was quite, uh, uh, perhaps it was easy in hindsight, but I always uh, was very careful not to take people on face value. And, you know, I guess that's also ingrained into our review process you know afterwards we ask people how are we doing what have we done well what haven't we done well getting feedback to to recalibrate or fine tune the way we do things for either every client or that specific client and making sure that we listen you know i guess that's it you know people want to know that you care yeah i think as well like even on top of that that sometimes people they they'll not know like they'll not know something. So you ask a question and they, they say something, but it might not be what they really think or mean, but it's sometimes it's like subconscious as well. So I think knowing when that comes up to actually draw it out, it's an important part of avoiding those, those things that can create roadblocks in people getting the results that they want with their money. Yeah, you, yeah, you have to be a good storyteller, Ben, don't you, to, to really get people to give you the, a well thought through or a thoughtful answer. You actually have to help them understand the, you know, the decision itself or the, or the circumstances and, you know, setting scenarios about retirement. What does it look like? How do you, like, there's a whole lot of storytelling that goes on that I find helps people picture and therefore they mm-hmm. can make better decisions because they understand more of the decision rather than just, you know, using their frame of reference, which is their knowledge, you know, in, the, in, in their years on this earth. You know, your challenge is to help them understand a better way of looking at the problem and then perhaps some of what they thought were pipe dreams are, are actual reality. Yes, and it's hard for, there's a lot of studies that show that it's really hard for people to identify with their future self. So I think that makes it hard for us as advisors when we're trying to tell people to make sensible decisions today and not, um, you know, spend every dollar that they've gotten a little bit more for good measure. <laughs> but to, to set up their future. So we've, we've got a battle on our hands for sure. Chris, my uh, last question for you is that if you could go back and um, do one thing differently, what would it be? I'm very much um, of the mindset. You know, you see those old movies where James Belushi did something different, ends up with a totally different life. I, I reflect on things and I go, I wouldn't change a thing, you know, because what if it came out worse? But the one thing that I didn't handle well was, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, um, during the GFC, I think I took far too much responsibility for outcomes that were outside of my control. And, you know, if I could go back and just reassure myself that, you know what, you can you can do your best efforts, you can be honest, you can do act in your client's best interests, you can care, you know, as much as possible for them, you still can't control the great unknowns. And I don't, I didn't handle it very well. It was highly stressful like it was for everybody that was around, I'm mm. sure. But, you know, I think I probably just, they, what I learned from that was just to always worry about the risks and keep people's feet on the ground when they're making investment decisions. So that's that was the good thing that came out of it. You know, that's advisors these days with 10-year timeframes have sort of never had to live through it. And so you've got to pass on the benefit of your of your experience in situations like that. But you know, d- definitely, I think I just took it all a little bit too personal when I should have had an equal amount of care, but not spent the time worrying about uh, you know the outcomes. 
Yeah, it's always a tough thing when the client ends up in any sort of tricky position, whether it's because of what's going on in markets or something that's happened with their money. If you're sort of helping them guide the ship and and uh, the shit hits a fan, you, you it's hard to not take that that responsibility. But as you say, it's like you're you make sure that you're aware of the risk that the risks are managed as much as they can be. But ultimately, you know, risk is there and it exists in in everything. And you know, if we if if we eliminate it totally, no one would be making any money. So, uh, and I'm yeah. sure Ben will never stop worrying about our advice leading to bad outcomes, and I'm sure I'll never feel like I shouldn't worry. So, you know, maybe <laughs> just put it into perspective is the best advice. Absolutely, wise words there, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing your story, mate. Really appreciate it. Uh, so much gold there. Yeah, thanks again. Great to be a part of it, Ben. Cheers, team. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>